Good morning. It's good to see everyone out today. Thank you for being here, and it's been a wonderful opportunity thus far to worship God together. I'm going to ask you to open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18. We're going to base really the entirety of our lesson this morning from a parable that Jesus tells there in Matthew chapter 18. A couple of Wednesday nights ago, we had a singing together, and Matt McKee, who's leading our singing this morning, actually led a song that, it had been a long time, I feel like, since we had sung here. It was called The Ninety and Nine, and that song, if you had an opportunity to go back and read the words to that song, it's really a beautiful and powerful song. But it is essentially telling the story of the parable that Jesus tells on two different occasions that are recorded for us. It's most likely a parable, a theme, a message that he used throughout his ministry. But it's a parable that's recorded both in Matthew chapter 18, verses 10 through 14, as well as Luke chapter 15, verses 3 through 7. We're going to focus in on the one that is told in Matthew chapter 18 this morning, and I want to begin by reading that together. Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse number 10. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety and nine and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And if he should find it, assuredly, I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the ninety and nine that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Such a beautiful story, and it paints such a vivid image for us, even though in our culture we are long separated from the days of shepherds watching over sheep. It is still an image and a story that we can connect with on a very real and meaningful level. There's a few specific points that I want to ask you to consider this morning that hopefully will make this parable really come to life for us today. Because I think there's a lot of application contained within these few short verses from Jesus' teaching. And there's one that I want to begin with that I feel like is very important to establish at the outset of a study of this parable. And that is when we consider the sheep that went astray, the one that left the ninety and nine behind, this was not a sheep that was taken from the flock. And that's an important principle to establish early on, because as we begin to make application to our lives today as a sheep in the Lord's fold, it is both important and comforting to know that the lost sheep, the one that Jesus has to go and look for to bring back, it was not taken from him. The reason that's important is because of what Jacob read for us in Romans chapter 8. Because we are told as the Lord's sheep, as followers of him, as ones that are in his family and in his flock, we cannot be taken from him. We cannot be taken from him. As strong and as real as Satan's influence is in this world, he does not have the power to forcefully remove us from the flock of Jesus. And we can take great comfort in that. The Lord died for that reality to be true. So that when you or I turn our lives over to God and become a child of his and are adopted into his family, Satan can do nothing to pull us away from him. To be able to live with that confidence and with that comfort 
is something that every Christian should long for and every Christian should hold on to every single day. To recognize the safety that is found within the arms of Christ. He is stronger than the wiles of Satan. And he will protect us. And he will hold us close to him. But that then begs the question, well, if the sheep can't be forcefully removed, if Satan can't come into the Lord's flock and drag one of us away, then how did the lost sheep get lost? Well, the verbiage that Jesus uses answers that question. Because he's not talking about a sheep that was taken. He's talking about a sheep that went. He's talking about a sheep that made a decision. He's talking about a sheep that made a choice. I was thinking about that really from two different perspectives. And one I think is a bit more obvious, so we're going to focus on the second. There are certainly instances in which people who at one point have given their lives to Christ curse God and walk out the door. However, (laughs) I believe that is the exception, not the rule for those who are lost. Because most of the time, it isn't the explosion and the storming out that we see. But instead, what we see are small, quote-unquote, insignificant, quote-unquote, decisions and choices that can ultimately lead one to be lost. I want to give you some examples to consider. We have wonderful Bible class programs here for kids as young as a year old, all the way to the oldest person here. Teachers who put in a lot of time and effort into preparing lessons, an environment that cultivates learning and study. Let's say you make the decision that Bible class really isn't that important. Or that, man, I got a lot on my plate right now. In Bible class, it just doesn't quite reach that level of importance where I'm going to put other things to the side. Okay. Well, Sunday nights, you know, we only come here a couple Sunday nights a month anyway. Do I really need to be here? I don't see anywhere in the Bible where it says I have to be here on Sunday nights. I've got some other things that I need to do. See where this is going? Each of these decisions may seem small. Each of these decisions may seem insignificant. What I want to challenge you to think about this morning is that couldn't be further from the truth. As parents, we have a responsibility to discipline our children. Well, that can be really hard sometimes to discipline kids. And it can be exhausting to constantly be parenting and nurturing them and instructing them. And so sometimes there's just days where I just don't want to fight that battle. Or I know it's important for me to spend time with my brothers and sisters. I know it's important for me to have people into my home. And I know it's important for me to to encourage and, and to be encouraged by my brothers and sisters. But man, I just work all the time. And I've got my kids have stuff going on at school. And that's just going to have to wait. All of these quote-unquote small decisions, all of these quote-unquote insignificant decisions, you have your head down and you're making decisions and you're making decisions and you're making decisions and then one day you look up and you start to look around. Like, I don't know where I am. (laughs) This doesn't look familiar anymore. This isn't, something's not right. That's how a lost sheep gets lost. You know, our whole theme for this year, for 2022, has been choosing the better 
one of the reasons that is so important is because it protects us from things like that. It acts as a guard for us in decision-making, like what I just described. When you think about whether or not you're going to come to Bible class, don't ask the question of, do I have to come to Bible class? What is the best decision that I can make that is going to keep me connected to the Lord? Let's come to Bible class because it gives me an opportunity to study his word with brothers and sisters and to grow closer to him through his word. Well, you can't point me to book, chapter, and verse where I have to be here on Sunday night. Well, I might challenge that a little bit. I understand the premise of the question. And to that, I would say, what is the best decision that you can make for your faith and for your relationship with God? is to take every opportunity that's made available to you to assemble with your brothers and sisters and to worship God together. So thinking about our theme and thinking about all of that conveys can help us as we navigate this life and as we're faced with decisions every single day, decisions that are either going to draw us closer to God or are going to begin to draw us away from God. And none of those decisions are small or insignificant. A few months ago, I I was thinking about this when I was preparing for this sermon. There was a few months ago where a a handful of us went out to Eagle Creek to run on some trails. And John Sims drew us a map of where we were going to run. And so we take off running, and the first little bit, you know, I've got my map out, and I'm following it. But I'm also running next to Dave Carlson, and Jacob Johnson was there, and I think Campbell was even there, and we're talking, and, you know, it's a beautiful day, we're out at the park, we're having a great time. And 20, 30, 40 minutes goes by, and we kind of stop, and we're like, I'm not exactly sure where we are. And so that map that I had in my pocket the whole time, I pulled it out, and I'm trying to figure out where we are, but I'm not 100% sure in that moment. And the reason that in that moment I wasn't really sure where I was isn't because I had crumpled up the map and thrown it in the trash and said, I'm not going to have anything to do with this map. The reason that I wasn't sure in that moment where I was is because I'd let the distraction of talking to Dave and Jacob keep me from paying attention to the map. I still had it in my pocket. Now, thankfully, we were just in Eagle Creek Park, and all of us had run those trails a billion times, so we were able to find our way out of there pretty easily. But I think there's really some significant application to a real-life experience like that and the much more serious situation that is being described in this parable. Sometimes the distractions that we each face in this life can cause us to spend less time in God's word and more time looking around the world around us. And when that happens, don't be surprised to look up one day and realize you don't know where you are. Don't be surprised to look up one day and realize the connection that you once had with God isn't what it once was. When I think about that day in the park, one of the reasons why it was so easy to get distracted is because I was so familiar with the trails at Eagle Creek Park. I've been on them so many times. So I didn't feel a need to look at the map. I was way too comfortable and overconfident in that situation. And the same can potentially be a pitfall to us when it comes to our relationship with the Lord. As time passes, we've been a Christian for longer and longer. We've read the Bible more and more. We've become more and more comfortable and confident in what it says. All of the sudden, quote unquote, all of the sudden, start to decide, eh, I know what that says. Daily Bible reading every single day? I know what it says. What do I need to read it every single day for? 
And you can see how that can snowball very quickly. So while it's important to remember that nothing and no one can forcefully remove us from the flock of Jesus, you have to make decisions every single day to stay in the flock of Jesus. Because the security and the comfort and the peace that the Lord provides to his family is something that you can give up at any time if you choose to do so. That's the free will that God has given you. Just like you're not going to be forcefully removed, you're not going to be forced to stay. We have to make decisions about that, choices that are going to influence our relationship with God. Tim referenced Hebrews chapter 11. Turn over there with me to Hebrews chapter 11. We, we talked uh, last Wednesday in our Bible class about this chapter, and in particular the verses that are talking about Moses in verses 24 through 26. And I think he is a great example of someone who embodies the importance of making decisions to stay connected with God and to grow in his relationship with God. Look what is said beginning in verse number 24 of of Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he looked to the reward. See, Moses made a choice. He made a choice not to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And instead, he made the choice to suffer affliction with the people of God. He made a choice not to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, but instead to esteem the reproach of Christ greater than any riches that could be found in Egypt. Moses made those choices, and those choices aided in his relationship with God growing stronger and stronger and stronger. You and I have the same choices to make. All of our choices are going to look slightly different, but all of those choices are going to do one of two things. They're going to do what they did for Moses, where you put away the passing pleasures of sin, You draw closer to God, even if that means suffering afflictions on behalf of his name. Or you allow the world to pull you away from him. You allow yourself to go astray. You make the decisions that are going to lead to you being lost and separated from the flock of God. Last point in regards to this parable is that we can clearly see, as Jesus concludes his teaching, that as he left the ninety and nine, he went to seek the one that had gone astray. We're told there in Matthew chapter 18, as well as in Luke chapter 19, verses 9 and 10, that we shouldn't be surprised by this action on behalf of Jesus, because this is the reason he came to this earth to begin with. He came to earth to seek and to save the lost. And so when that one sheep goes astray, Jesus is going to seek, and he is going to seek, and he is never going to stop seeking. That should tell us just how valuable each one of us are to him. That should tell us just how important you are to Jesus. He gave up heaven to come and find you. He left the right hand of his father to come and look for you. When I think about 
just how valuable I am to Christ. It humbles me in a way that nothing else in this life truly can. You mean the creator of the universe cares about me? How many billions of people have lived on this earth? He cares about me? Yeah. He cares so much that not only did he leave heaven to come down to earth, he was willing to suffer and to die for you. It's not just Jesus that should be looking and seeking those who are lost. Because we're part of his family, and therefore we value what he values. We love what he loves. We do what he does. And as such, I also should have the same type of love and place the same type of value on every single soul that he does. And so if he's willing to do whatever it takes to bring someone back into the fold, I should also be willing to do whatever it takes to try and help bring them back into the fold. Now don't misunderstand me. Christ is the only one, the only one, who can save the lost. But I can help. I can help, and I can help because I have the mind of Christ in front of me. I can help because I understand the power of the gospel. I can help because I may have personal relationships with those who have gone astray. And maybe I can say something or do something to help turn them back to the Lord. And help bring them back into the safety and the comfort and the peace of his flock. But that requires us to love like Christ loves. It requires us to be there for one another and to support one another, to encourage one another, and to correct one another. And so if you see me doing this, please don't let me get here. If you see me doing this, take that opportunity to try and correct me. You would be my friend to do so. And if we all have that mindset, as we sit here as a local body of God's people, that certainly I have to be mindful of the decisions that I make day in and day out and make sure that I am constantly making the best decisions that support my relationship with God. But if you also are concerned about the decisions that I make and I'm concerned about the decisions that you're making and we're willing to be a part of each other's lives and to help one another when needed and correct one another and admonish one another when needed, together we will grow stronger as a local body of Christians. And we can help one another grow in our relationship with God. There is great rejoicing when one who is lost is found. As we wrap things up today, I, I want you just to consider for a moment that truth. That there is not shame placed upon the one who is lost and returns to the fold. There is joy. So if you're here this morning and you have been a part of God's fold, a part of his flock, a part of his family, and you have gone astray, We want to encourage you to come back, to experience again the great comfort and peace found in being a part of his family.
And I promise you there's going to be a bunch of people who want to wrap their arms around you and help you and pray for you and encourage you as you grow in your relationship with God. Likewise, there may be some here this morning who have never been a part of God's fold. You're living on the outside of God's family, 